So hello, everybody. Uh, I assume that we can start this meeting. Today, we have the honor to have uh, Dr. Monique Taylor with us. She's an expert on China's uh, oil and energy uh, sector. So the, the security issue is particularly fascinating for me. Uh, Dr. Monique Taylor, she's a senior lecturer in world politics at our University of Helsinki. She previously has uh, held the position of postdoctoral fellow at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, research fellow at National University of Singapore and lecturer at the University of Queensland. Uh, I noticed that Moni has her book, uh, which published a few years ago on the Chinese state oil and energy security, and uh, in which she analyzed policy rationales and institutional underpinnings of China's uh, status strategy. And I understand many years have passed and perhaps there are some changes uh, in this regard. So I think it's uh, timely that we invite uh, Monique to give us an insight on what has changed inside uh, China's oil and energy sector. Thank you very much, Monique, for being with us today. And I guess the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Julie, for the introduction and um, also for inviting me to, to give this presentation. Okay, so in this talk, I will be revisiting the research I conducted um, for my PhD, which I then transformed into a book titled The Chinese State Oil and Energy Security, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2014. So I've since moved on to look at other research topics, so either, although I do maintain an interest in this one. So right now I'm exploring um, China's internet governance, uh, but Julie asked me if I would like to talk about my book, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to reflect on the work that I did um, back then, and also think about more recent developments, which may or may not have affected some of the original arguments and insights that I wrote about eight years ago. So China's energy security was a hot topic in both policy and academic circles around the mid to late 2000s when I conducted this research. So this was a time of increasing oil prices, particularly the period from 2003 to 2008, with oil peaking at nearly 150 US dollars per barrel in 2008. So when I started research on this topic, these oil price hikes were occurring. And simultaneously, China had ramped up its global search for oil assets due to fears of supply shortages. And one of the main reasons behind surging oil prices in the 2000s was increasing demand from China. So China's energy needs had rapidly expanded off the back of the acceleration in economic growth and development that took off in the 1990s. So as a result, energy security became a top policy priority for Beijing and a key driver behind much of its international behavior, particularly with regards to its assertive diplomatic and economic strategies towards oil rich regions. So there was a lot of reporting on this in the news media and also increasing attention in the academic literature. This level of attention has since declined a bit since the world entered a period of low oil prices um, from the mid 2010s. And this was largely due to the US um, shale revolution driving down oil prices and turning the US into a net oil exporter, hence changing the geopolitics and geoeconomics of oil and opening up new options for China to secure oil supply, which I'll be talking about a bit later. So this presentation has two parts. I'll begin by pro providing an overview of China's energy dilemma and its approach to ensuring energy security with a brief look at how Beijing's energy strategies have evolved over the past couple of decades. And then I'll focus on the conceptual framework and main arguments that are developed in the book. So on this slide is a pie chart showing China's primary energy consumption by fuel type in 2020. So China is the world's largest consumer of energy accounting for 25% of global energy demand. As you can see here, crude oil accounts for 20% of China's energy consumption, while the figure for coal stands at 57%. Compared to, why I, why I originally, can, can, compared to when I originally conducted this research, using statistics from 2012, there have been some changes in the percentages for each fuel type. So between 2012 and 2020, coal consumption declined by 
and consumption of all the other energy types uh, increased to varying degrees. Oil in increased from 18 to 20 percent and renewables saw the biggest increase from 1 percent in 2012 to 5 percent in 2020. With regard to renewables, even though its share of total energy consumption is small, it's worth noting that China um, has the world's largest capacity for wind energy and has around one third of the world's um, solar generation, generation capacity. So if you add the non-fossil fuels together, that is hydro, nuclear and renewables, they account for 15% of China's energy use up from 9% in 2012. So this means that 85% of China's energy needs are still met by fossil fuels. So China produces its own oil. In fact, it ranks sixth in the world for oil production ahead of notably big producers such as United Arab Emirates, Iran and Brazil. But its oil demand outstrips domestic production. So we here we have a graph that shows the ever increasing gap between China's domestic oil production and oil consumption. So this gap is filled by imported oil. On this slide is a pie chart showing China's crude oil imports by region in 2019. China surpassed the US as the world's largest crude oil importer in 2017, and currently it imports more than 10 billion barrels per day. China's oil import dependency is high at over 70%. Uh, Therefore, oil is the biggest source of energy insecurity for China. Currently, China imports oil from around 50 countries. These oil imports mostly consist of oil purchased from the open market, and a relatively small, small proportion consists of equity oil that is shipped to China. So compared to the figures dating from 2010 that I obtained in the original research, there have been some changes. While the proportion of um, supply that comes from the Middle East has remained roughly the same, the share from Africa declined from 32% to 18%. So that's quite a significant uh, drop. There have been increases in the share of supply from Russia and Europe, and a doubling from the Western Hemisphere from 18, uh, sorry, from 8 to 15%, mostly from Latin American countries, notably Brazil. China has also been purchasing record amounts of American crude oil. So the drop in the share of African oil has occurred for a few reasons. Firstly, Africa's largest oil supply, well, oil producers, Angola and Sudan, have seen declining production. So in the case of Sudan, this was because of the civil war. And in Angola, it has mainly been due to underinvestment in exploration and production. China's oil companies have also learned some lessons from their earlier investments in Africa, both in terms of political risk, um, overpaying for oil fields, and essentially making some bad investments. Furthermore, many of the oil fields purchased by China's oil companies have been depleted over the past decade, and there has been little investment in exploration. So this might also contribute to the declining share of African oil. Another big factor is that previously China competed with the US for oil supplies, with the US of course dominating the Middle East. The shale revolution in the US changed this landscape, leaving China as the biggest client for all oil exporters, including Saudi Arabia. And this has diminished the importance of the African suppliers. So diversification of the sources of oil supply is an important part of China's energy security strategy. And while the pie chart indicates a reasonably high level of diversification according to region, it obscures the fact that China is still very much reliant on a handful of large oil producers, all of which have complicated geopolitical situations. So the top five for China are Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iraq, Angola and Brazil. And together they account for close to 60% of China's oil imports. So I've included here a simple definition of energy security on this slide. It is the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. <laughs> 
So when thinking conceptually about energy security approaches, there are two camps, the mercantilist approach and the liberal approach. So these centuries old economic theories offer opposing views on what the relationship between the state and the economy should be. Mercantilism is framed by a zero sum worldview and advocates government intervention in international trade to generate wealth, strengthen national power and benefit domestic businesses. So present day oil mercantilism refers to a government led energy security strategy, which relies on state owned oil companies to secure reliable and affordable oil supply. Oil mercantilists favor energy independence and define energy security in terms of the security of oil supply, which they seek to ensure through state led oil production, both at home and abroad. So this includes things like buying up foreign oil fields with such oil deals being sweetened and supported by broader trade aid and diplomatic efforts. The liberal approach on the other hand, argues that markets are the appropriate means through which to achieve energy security. So rather than energy independence, liberals emphasize interdependence where global energy needs are satisfied through buying and selling by consumers and producers on the open market. Here, little if any state involvement or intervention is required and is in fact considered undesirable. So liberals critique mercantilists by arguing that mercantilism makes no sense in a globalized world. They say that the price mechanism which ensures oil goes to the highest bidder, and this results in an efficient allocation of oil resources. They also point out that most of the oil that's produced by a country's national oil company is sold on the open market anyway, making energy mercantilism unnecessary and redundant. So a critique of the liberal approach by mercantilists say that liberals ignore geopolitics. So for instance, oil embargoes and blockades have been used in the past to prevent imports from reaching their destination. Hence, oil doesn't always go to the highest bidder in reality. Also, anything from corruption to strategic alliances between countries can distort the market mechanism and therefore the market shouldn't be relied on solely in order to achieve energy security. So turning now to China's energy security strategy, although China does obtain the bulk of its oil supply from the market, the Chinese government pursues a range of policies that are consistent with the logic of mercantilism. So China has sought to insulate itself from coercive measures such as oil embargoes and blockades that could be enforced by the US and its allies, which could happen in the event of military conflict in the South China Sea or over Taiwan. So oil mercantilism is essentially a hedging strategy against these kinds of risks to supply disruption. And the following are the main elements of China's strategy. The first is to increase domestic oil production. So China tries to do this as much as possible, but its demand for oil uh, simply outpaces that domestic production. The other is equity oil and overseas acquisition of oil assets. So China became a net oil importer in 1993. And from then on, China's national oil companies were encouraged to go abroad and secure oil supplies, a phenomenon which accelerated in the 2000s following the promulgation of the Go Global policy. Acquisitions by China's national oil companies of overseas oil fields and equity production has been a distinctive feature of China's energy security strategy. Although much of China's equity oil is sold on the market, from the perspective of the Chinese government, the point of this ownership is that the oil can be directed to China in the event of a market disruption. So China's oil companies were in the past very much willing to pay high prices uh, for uh, oil fields and equity oil. And some commentators say that they overpaid uh, for these foreign oil assets throughout the 2000s, particularly those located in various African countries. So this kind of energy behavior seemed to indicate that the motivating factor for these companies was security over and, over and above the commercial imperative. So in other words, the investment decisions made by China's national oil companies were not always purely uh, based on business considerations as these companies are charged with ensuring the country's energy security. 
China's equity oil strategy has evolved over the past two decades. In the earlier years, Chinese oil companies followed the buying spree approach, particularly in Africa, paying high prices and taking on a lot of risk in the process. In more recent years, they have moved away from buying oil fields, instead gaining control of oil flows from other national oil companies, a phenomenon that is facilitated by the increasing use of oil backed loans. So such loans were made in Africa during the 2000s, and a lot more were made uh, by the China Development Bank following the global financial crisis to Russia and a number of Latin American and Central Asian countries. So it can be argued that this is a less risky strategy than buying oil fields. This is because purchasing oil fields carries a greater operational risk and uncertainty and has, as has occurred in some cases, can result in economic loss. On the other hand, the oil backed loans are entered into with sovereign entities and they're secured against state owned infrastructure, thus mitigating the risk of loan default and economic loss. And effectively, these loans provide China with a call option upon oil production from the country of investment. So another major element of China's strategy is diversification of oil suppliers, refining capacity, uh, capability and transportation routes. So it goes without saying that relying on a single country or region for imports is much riskier than importing from multiple countries and regions. And in the past, China has been particularly keen to reduce its reliance on oil from the Middle East. The diversification of transportation routes and also methods of transportation has become more important and pronounced. So 90% of China's import, oil imports arrive by sea and most, with most of them passing through the Straits of Malacca. So China is trying to reduce the risk of supply disruption, for instance, by naval blockade, by building oil pipelines, notably from places like Kazakhstan, Myanmar and Myanmar. And one has also been proposed for Pakistan. Um, another area in which China has been active is in building uh, strategic and filling strategic petroleum reserves. Uh, so to further protect itself from short term disruptions in oil supply, China has been developing a, uh, a government controlled strategic petroleum reserve. And this is something that a lot of countries do. So low, low oil prices led China to buy up a lot of cheap oil to fill its SPR. As a result, it doubled in size from 2014 to 2015, and it currently contains over 100 days of imports. Moving on to economic statecraft and oil diplomacy with major oil producers. So this is another important dimension. So as China's oil import dependency grew, Beijing sought greater influence over the suppliers. So oil diplomacy has been key, entailing visits by China's leaders to oil producing regions to facilitate oil deals. And this is often combined with offers of loans, aid and trade deals. And finally, military modernization. So while the motivation for China's military modernization is obviously way broader, then concerns about energy security, the need to protect the sea lanes, uh, since 90% of China's oil arrives by sea, um, is, or oil imports arrives by sea, is frequently offered as a key rationale for naval modernization efforts. So has China's energy security strategy changed over time? So what I talked about on the previous slide was very much what was happening um, around the time that I wrote the book. Um, but we can think about changes now over the past five to eight years. So I reflected on the evolution and the changes to China's energy security strategy. Um, I think the, oil, the Chinese oil companies have become more risk conscious and diverse and have been less inclined to continue this buying spree approach. And they've really pulled back from buying foreign oil fields and are more focused on getting the best price for oil on global markets, and also more in the area of oil trading and financing. So uh, this was also a trend, particularly following the global financial crisis of doing more oil backed deals, uh, oil backed loans rather, which ties in with what I just said. It's a less risky approach than buying oil fields and one that still secures uh, long-term supplies of oil. Um, in terms of addressing the supply disruption risk, China is focusing more on diversification of oil suppliers and transportation routes, 
And that's why it's pursuing this sort of oil pipeline development in multiple countries. Also, China's energy strategy now falls under the Belt and Road Initiative. So this means that political support that the oil companies receive is less than before um, and exists as part of the broader BRI rather than being specific to oil. Um, we've also seen the integration of China's energy strategy into the BRI using the oil backed loans. And this affords greater flexibility and more options for China. In addition, the loans made to the host countries are often then used to fund a wide range of infrastructure development um, into which Chinese technology, skills and labour are then sourced, thus providing a further economic sort of uplift for China. So I'll briefly mention some broad critiques of China's oil mercantilism. Um, so there were uh, at the time I did the research, there were accusations that China was locking in oil supply and undermining um, or distorting global oil markets in the process. And that such an approach also encouraged competition and even conflict over oil resources. Another major criticism was that China's oil mercantilism in Africa and elsewhere was akin to neo-colonialism. And the same, a similar thing has sort of been said by the, about the BRI. So on this slide, I've included the cover of a 2008 issue of The Economist calling China the new colonialists. So the notion here being that China's international economic behavior exhibits a pattern of exploitation and one-sidedness similar to the former colonialism of Western powers, along with a tendency to sort of coddle dictators and turn a blind eye to human rights abuses, corruption, and so on. Okay, so that's the subject matter I was working with. Now I'll turn to the conceptual frameworks and arguments um, in my book. First, we'll look at the Chinese state in, academic, in the academic literature. So when reviewing the existing literature, I found that at a general level, there exists two images of China. So there's a strong tendency in the international relations literature to view the Chinese state as a unitary and monolithic political system. So this is sometimes called the China Inc. view. When applied to the topic of China's energy security, such a perspective sees China's national oil companies as arms of the state, seamlessly implementing government strategies and directives. The other view, which pervades the governance and China studies literature, is of a weak, decentralized and fragmented Chinese state. And the genesis of this perspective um, can be traced to Lieberthal and Oxenberg's 1988 book titled Policymaking in China, Leader Structures and Processes. So according to this view, China's oil companies do their own thing, pursuing their own commercial interests, and they're not beholden to Beijing in any major way. So my book um, occupies the middle ground between these two opposing views on China. So I think the idea of a monolithic state doesn't really exist anywhere, let alone in China. So this idea is a fiction in and of itself. Fragmentation and decentralization clearly exist in the Chinese political system. And this has been documented extensively um, in numerous uh, studies across many different economic sectors. However, I think it does tell only one part of the story as there are sort of levers and mechanisms of control within the political system that also hold it together and facilitate a sort of top down, ultimately a top down flow of political authority. So I think the weak and fragmented China perspective often overstates its case. Despite fragmentation, things are not falling apart. The central government in China gets things done when it wants to. And there are specific institutions and mechanisms that enable it to do this, uh, which tend to be downplayed in some of the literature. So things such as the party's control over personnel appointments, the performance and career incentives that are established in state-owned enterprises, the presence of party committees in both state-owned and private firms, and so on. So in my book, I adopted an inside-out perspective on China's energy security approach by investigating the nature of the state apparatus that supports it, paying particular attention to the development of the national oil companies and their relationship with the Chinese government, which has changed over time. <clears throat> 
So in doing so, I examined China's oil industry development across seven decades since the inception of the People's Republic of China in 1949 through to 2013, with the main focus being on the reform era, which began in, in 1978. So I identified three distinct periods characterized by particular economic reforms and modes of governance in the oil sector. And importantly, I found that among other things, situating the analysis in historical perspective revealed how waves of economic and administrative decentralization and recentralization um, account for the changing relationship between the oil companies and the central party state over time and have also influenced their international behavior. So I mainly drew upon literatures on both economic transition and bureaucratic politics in China for the conceptual insights and frameworks that I used. So I spent a lot of time examining the interplay of elite and bureaucratic power and flows of authority in the Chinese political system. And here the main conceptual model used by Sinologists to explain governance and the policy process is fragmented authoritarianism. So it argues that political authority below the apex of the central party state is fragmented and disjointed, resulting in a protracted and incremental policy process. The existence of bureaucratic overlaps, unclear responsibilities and turf wars between rival um, bureaucratic institutions often dilutes or thwarts policy implementation. And given that governance in China is also regionally de decentralized, local governments bargain with central governments over with the central government over policies, which also serves to impede their implementation. So while uh, I'll call it FA from now on, while FA retains explanatory power, it is a static model that cannot account for institutional change, which there has been a lot of over the past few decades. And there is a, another model less frequently applied to the case of China, um, although it was adapted for the Chinese case back in 1992 by Hamrin and Zhao called bureaucratic authoritarianism. So it shifts the focus to the hierarchical nature of the Chinese state and its vertical relationships that exist between party state elites and the bureaucratic agencies. So the focus here is what holds the system together and makes it work despite the fragmentation. So I think both perspectives are useful for examining China's political system as they highlight different things. So during Hu Jintao's leadership, efforts were made to re-centralize the party state and these have been continued and intensified under Xi Jinping's leadership. And while fragmentation remains a problem, I don't think you can ignore the restructuring of the government and bureaucracy that has occurred, and it has had an impact on policy and the oil companies. So turning now to really um, the crux of the book, which is the relationship between the Chinese government and the national oil companies. So there are three main oil companies in China, all of which are state owned and occupy monopoly positions. So these are the China National Offshore Oil Corporation or CNUC, which originally specialized in offshore oil development. The China National Petroleum Corp Corporation or CNPC and its subsidiary PetroChina. Um, and they, they used to specialize in upstream oil exploration and production. And then there's Sinopec, which um, specialized in oil refining. In 1998, they were restructured into vertically integrated conglomerates. And in the process, they swapped some of their assets. So they would have both upstream and downstream profiles. And so would sort of compete with each other in a, in a limited kind of way. So there are two periods in their development um, which are important to understand. So the first two periods I listed here are what I covered in the book. And then I sort of quickly put together a third period uh, for this talk uh, that resulted from the reading I did over the past um, month or so leading up to this talk. So the first was the decentralization and corporatization of China's oil sector from 1978 to 2002. So the oil companies were created out of line ministries in the 1980s and in the 1990s they were restructured and prepared for partial privatization and international competition. 
So during this time, they were essentially left to their own devices. At that time, the, the Chinese leadership was not paying as close attention to energy security as it would later on. And the country did not have an energy security strategy as such. So the administrative apparatus of the oil industry was largely dismantled during this time with even the energy ministry being abolished in 1993. So even in its place, a raft of energy related institutions was left to govern the industry, a messy situation that gave rise to some confusion and coordination problems. So the most authoritative actors were actually the national oil companies. Hence, they took the lead in terms of policy and market regulation, and their commercial activities were sufficient to ensure a stable supply of oil to China. So the decision by the government to decentralize the oil sector and delegate some authority downwards was a deliberate one that was intended to revive what was at the time a failing industry. Um, and it was part of an overarching plan to withdraw from micromanagement of state-owned enterprises. So in the early 2000s, the newly created subsidiaries of the national oil companies were listed on domestic and international stock exchanges. Um, but in each case, the government remained the majority shareholder. So the period following this was characterized by restructuring and efforts to re-centralize China's oil sector. So by the 2000s, energy security had become a, pro a policy priority for Beijing. And it was evidence, evident from the governance landscape um, that the oil industry was in need of reform. So to this end, there were rounds of reform and restructuring that aimed to re-centralize and streamline the bureaucracy. And it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into detail about that. But I will mention a particularly important development, which was the establishment of the State Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, known as SASAC, in 2003. So SASAC is the investor of state-owned assets on behalf of the government, uh, the central government, and as such exercises ownership rights over the assets of the national oil companies. It's also responsible for appointing top executives for the remuneration allowance allocations and approving both mergers and acquisitions and the sales of assets. So the combined ownership and regulatory powers give SASAC an enormous amount of authority over the policies and strategic direction of the national oil companies. So the internationalization of the national oil companies and the launch of the going out policy or go global policy in 2001 were also instrumental for Beijing in creating a more coherent approach towards the international policy dimension of China's oil strategy. The preference for equity stakes in oil fields was advanced through this period uh, with Beijing providing strategic guidance on where the NOCs, the national oil companies uh, should invest as well as financial support. The recentralization trend has been continued and intensified under Xi Jinping's leadership. Um, and a major focus in the early days was to bring the oil companies more in line with China's state interests and objectives. So uh, Xi Jinping has also bro broken up what was perceived to be a powerful petroleum faction cons consisting of oil company executives who were educated in the West and had extensive international experience. He did this via his anti-corruption campaign, which resulted in the resignation of top oil company executives as they were under investigation for and charged with corruption. So this has increased the power of the central government vis-a-vis -vis the oil companies. So this was a disruptive period for those companies that lasted for a few years in the mid 2010s um, and which sort of put a pause on some of their uh, previously proactive overseas activities. Uh, the oil companies earlier splurge on unsuccessful acquisitions came under scrutiny during that time as well. So the companies became much more hesitant to do that again. So they're now more focused on increasing their role in global markets. And while the monopolistic structure of the oil sector has not fundamentally changed, limited competition has been introduced since 2015 into some segments of it, such as oil refining and also oil trading with some non-state firms being permitted to import oil, for instance. So 
There are two broad views on the relationship between the government and the oil companies, with some scholars suggesting that they are arms of the state, while others argue that it's actually the oil companies that spearhead China's energy strategy and act independently of Beijing. And a term here which is frequently used is out of the tail wagging the dog. So the scholars who view the relationship through the lens of FA tend to point to things like administrative decentralization in the 80s and 90s, the corporatization of the oil companies and so on to essentially argue that the tail wags the dog. Um, so that is that the oil companies form a powerful group within the Chinese state that pursue their own vested interests and exercise, I guess what you'd say is middle up authority within the political system to influence policy making. So I think each view taken alone is overly simplistic and fails to capture the complexity of the relationship. So the, from the research I conducted, the reality seemed to be a little bit more nuanced. So the term I use to describe the relationship is collaboration governed by hierarchy. So the flow of authority between the government and the oil companies goes both ways. And since the oil companies understand the industry, far better than China's leaders do, they are compelling policy advisors and initiators. However, ultimate top-down authority does rest with the Chinese government. It retains powerful levers and mechanisms of control through ownership, financing, personnel appointments and remuneration and so on. So the, oil, the national oil companies have by and large executed China's energy security strategy and I think this is really exemplified by the fact that they followed the more risky and financially costly approach of securing equity oil in that um, decade that I really focused on in my research. So to summarize, I've included a couple of the main arguments made in my book, and it's sort of just reiterating uh, what I said in a more concise way. So from 2002 to 2013, the central party state strengthened the political, institutional and organisational capacities that enabled it to exert more centralised top-down authority, while at the same time retaining the commercial incentives and dynamism that were created through decentralisation and corporatization of the oil companies during the earlier stages of oil industry development. So this enabled the execution of a mercantilist energy security strategy. So while the NOCs, uh, the oil companies, possess operational autonomy and are commercially oriented most of the time, which they are, they behave a little differently to international oil companies, probably, you know, 90% or more of the time. Their broad strategic direction remains subject to guidance and interference by Beijing. And despite the earlier decentralization and corporatization of China's oil industry, the central party state retains many levers of control that enable it to impose that top-down authority. But this doesn't mean that the companies, the oil companies are simply arms of the state. So they possess the technical expertise and international experience to advise and contribute to policy development. Hence the relationship is better defined as collaboration governed by hierarchy. So it acknowledges the flow of authority goes in both directions, but which in the end is ultimately governed by that steep hierarchy that exists within the Chinese state. And that concludes my presentation.